Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Jeff Hint uh, Professor Jeff Hinton to uh, give the second talk today. And he will review some of the, the basics um, that he talked about this morning in case some of you are not here. Um, and I'm not going to uh, give all the uh, uh, lengthy instruction except to say that um, he's universally recognized to be a, a, a pioneer in, in um, machine learning and in neural network. So without further ado, I will have him uh, to give the second uh, lecture on information retrieval using um, multi-layer neural network. Thank you. Um, what I'm going to do is the first half of the talk is going to be about using short codes found by neural networks to do document retrieval. And this is mainly published work with Russ Salakutinov. And then the second talk will be applying the same ideas to image retrieval, where it's much more interesting. Because for document retrieval, you have good ways of doing it. And for image retrieval, you don't, as far as I can tell. Um, I'm going to spend the first five minutes, just very quickly, going over the basic learning algorithm, which I talked about this morning. If you want to know more details, look at this morning's talk. Um, for the document retrieval, we have to figure out how to model bags of words with the kind of learning module I'm going to use. And then I'm going to show how to learn short binary codes and how to use those for extremely fast retrieval. Basically, retrieval in no time. There's no search involved at all in the retrieval. So we can do sort of approximate matching, matching at the speed of hashing. Um, and then I'll apply that to image retrieval. And this is very much work in, process, in progress. And we just got preliminary results a couple of weeks ago. So five minutes on the basic learning ideas. We're going to make networks out of stochastic binary neurons, which get some input from the layer below and give an output, which is a probabilistic function of the input. And there's a 1 or a 0. We're going to hook those neurons up into a two-layer network with some observable neurons and some hidden neurons are going to learn features. So we put the data here, and this is going to learn features of the data. It's going to be symmetrically connected. And we're going to try and learn all these weights just by looking at the data with no label information. And the learning algorithm is going to be, you take some data, you put it in here. Using the weights you currently have, you decide for each feature detector whether it should be on or off. They'll make probabilistic decisions, but if they get lots of input, they'll probably turn on, and lots of negative input, they'll probably turn off. Then from the binary states of these feature detectors, you try and reconstruct the data using the same weighted connections. And then from the reconstructed data, you activate the feature detectors again. And you're going to try and train the model so that it's happy with the data and unhappy with the reconstructed data. You want it to believe in reality and not to believe in the kind of things it would prefer to fantasize about. So the way it works is you say, here's some data. Where would you like to go today? And wherever it would like to go, you make it as difficult as possible. So you unlearn on this, and you learn on that. So the learning algorithm looks like this. You take the pairwise statistics of how often an element of the data, like a pixel or a word in a bag of words, is on, and a feature detector is on. How often they're on together? Measure that correlation. And then with the reconstructed data, measure the same correlation. And the difference of those two correlations provides you a learning signal. And now once you've trained one layer, you can train a deep many layers by taking the feature detectors of one layer and making their activations be the data for training the next layer. And you can prove that something good happens when you do that. And if you want to know more about it, look at this morning's talk. OK. So now we're going to apply it in a way different from how we applied it this morning. Basically, all interesting data lies on or near some lower dimensional manifold in a high dimensional space. If I give you million dimensional data, if it was really in a million dimensions, life would be completely hopeless because every new data point would be outside the convex hull of the previous data points and you couldn't do anything. But if I give you, say, a 1,000 by 1,000 image, actually, not all images are equally likely. And the images you'll actually see lie on some low dimensional manifolds, but maybe a number of such manifolds. In this morning's talk, what we tried to do was model those manifolds by going to a high dimensional space and learning an energy function that has ravines in it for each of the manifolds. 
That's what I call implicit dimensionality reduction, because we go to this high dimensional space to capture the manifolds. And that's good for capturing multiple manifolds when you don't know their dimensionality. There's something that's far more standard, which is what I call explicit dimensionality reduction, where you say in advance, OK, I'm going to try and represent this data by n numbers, which you can think of as coordinates on the manifold. How do I find the best n numbers? So principal components is a prime example of an explicit dimensionality reduction method. So I'm going to, first of all, to sort of link to this morning's talk, um, apply this to images of handwritten digits. And we're going to have all sorts of different digits here, of different categories. But now, instead of going to a high dimensional space, we're going to go down to 30 real numbers. And what we'd like to do is have this neural net that extracts lots of features from the image, then compresses a little bit, so finds correlations among those features and has features for those, then finds correlations for those features, and eventually goes down to a small number of linear features here. And we can learn this module unsupervised. That is, we show it data, and we just learn these features in the way I sketched. Then we take the feature vectors that we got here from data, and we learn these features, all unsupervised. And then we learn these features, and we learn these features. Now, each time I learn one of these modules, because of the way I learned it, the features are quite good at reconstructing the data. So these features will be quite good at reconstructing that. And these features will be quite good at reconstructing that. And these features will be good at reconstructing that. And these will be OK at reconstructing that. And so now we take the weight matrices that we learned here, and we put them all in backwards here. So from these features, we try and reconstruct this. And that's what these W4 transpose is doing. And from these, we try and reconstruct those, and so on, back to the data. So after I've done my initial training, my unsupervised learning of these modules, one at a time, I unroll the whole system, put the transpose weights up here, and then I'm going to train the whole system as a standard neural net with backpropagation. That is, I'm going to say, I would like the output to look exactly like the input. So my desired output is whatever the input was. I take the difference between the actual output and the desired output, and I backpropagate it through all these layers. Now, if you start off with small random weights here, as we used to do in neural nets, um, nothing happens. Because the derivative you get here is small times small times small times small times small times small times small. That's small to the seventh, and which is no derivative at all. If you use big weights here, you've already decided what it ought to be doing randomly. And that doesn't seem like a good idea. You don't want to decide the features randomly. That was the point of using small weights. But if you use small weights, it won't learn. What this initialization does by learning this module, so that these are good at reconstructing those and these are good at reconstructing those, is it gets features um, to get you going. And then you can fine tune these features with backpropagation. And when we fine tune, these weights will become different from those weights. And these ones will become different from those ones. OK. So here's an example of this is one random image of each class. That's the real data. And for that autoencoder I just showed you, after it's trained, the training takes a while. It takes like um, of the order of a, a day on, a, on one core or an hour on a GPU board. Um, these are the reconstructions of the data from those 30 numbers. So we've turned this image into 30 numbers. And we reconstruct it from 30 numbers, and it's pretty good. In fact, I would argue the reconstruction is actually better than the data. So look at this. There's a little gap there, and it's gone, gone away there. It's a bit dangerous to argue reconstructions are better than the data, because you ought to be unlearning on your reconstructions and learning on the data. But anyway, if you do standard PCA, you can see it's a much worse way of trying to get that information into 30 numbers. So finally, for, for many, I first thought about doing this in 1983, no, sorry. Yeah, 1983 with Boltzmann machines, and then 1985 with backpropagation. And we could never get it to work. The fact that it didn't work didn't stop some people publishing papers about it. Um, but eventually, we've got it to work in deep nets now. And it's clearly much better than PCA. So if you don't do backpropagation, how much, how much worse is it going to get? Um, probably it would be probably worse than PCA without the backpropagation. But I don't know the answer. I should know, but I don't. So now we're going to apply it to documents. And initially, we're going to use it just for visualizing documents. So suppose I give you a big document set, and I say, lay these documents out in two dimensions so I can see the sort of structure of the data set. 
just a, a standard visualization. We want a map of document space and see how it's populated. Well, I could obviously use an autoencoder for that. What I could do is I could train a model that has the counts for, say, the 2,000 commonest non-stop words. And from th that count vector of 2,000 counts, if I could figure out how to model it with one of my Boltzmann machines, I could learn some binary features and then some binary features. And then I could learn this little net, which goes down to two real numbers. Obviously, you're not going to extract uh, uh, reconstruct 250 activities very well from two numbers, but you can do a lot better than random. Um, like if these are sort of political documents, you'd expect high probabilities for political kinds of things. Um, and from these two real numbers, we're going to now try and reconstruct the word counts. We're not going to do very well, but now we can fine-tune it with that propagation. And then we can look to see how well we did. And as a comparison, we can use um, a two-dimensional version of latent semantic analysis, where what you would do is take the word counts, take the log of one plus the word count, and then do PCA on that. So we took a big document set of um, 800,000 documents, a Reuters document set that's publicly available, and where they give you the word counts. And we used two-dimensional latent semantic analysis, that is basically PCA done in a sensible way. And it's all done without knowing the classes of the documents. And then once you've laid them out in 2D, you color, there's a point per document, you color the points by the classes, because all these documents have been hand-labeled by what class they are. And you can see PCA, um, the, the, there's green ones that are down here, and there's sort of more reddish ones here. There's some structure, but it's not very good. And it's the fact we're using log of one plus that causes this funny structure here. Now, in other words, you'd never have any big negative numbers going in. Um, now we apply our method, and that's what we get. And we would argue that this is better. Um, we've labeled the main classes here. It comes with a hierarchy of classes. Um, they're sort of business documents. But if I told you that was the accounts and earnings statement for Enron, do you want to invest in this company? My advice would be probably not. Um, so it's found structure in the document. Is this after the uh, back propagation? It's after the back propagation, yes. So have you compared with LDA instead of PCA? A latent Dirichlet allocation? Uh, linear, uh, um, no, but this will do much better. In other work, we've compared this kind of stuff with linear discriminant analysis. And these multiple nonlinear layers are a big win for this kind of stuff. I can refer you to another paper comparing that. Um, in the middle, you're not so sure. Those are probably short documents. A document with a lot of words, you get much more confident about where it is. So you get to see structure in the data. Can you explain why it's sort of star-shaped? I mean, most clustering techniques, most of the examples you see published are you know, isolated clusters. So why do you think everything's pooling towards 0, 0 here? It's a very good question. And when we use non-parametric dimensionality reduction techniques on this, we get clusters. Um, basically, it's because this vector is being used to determine the probabilities of the output words. And when you don't know, you want them all to be in the same place. So all the uncertain ones, you want to be in the same place. As you get more confident, you can afford to have more, less entropy in the output distribution. But what you want is for short documents, you're bound to have a high entropy output distribution. So all very short documents should have, give very similar distributions because there aren't enough words to know. It's partially an artifact of the metric between the input and the output. It's partly an artifact of that, yes. Um, are you normalizing the document, uh, the, the term counts, or are you just you taking the raw term counts? This is the raw term count. So you're not doing probability of word. No, because we're doing probability of word, but multiply that by the number of words. So yes. Right. Yeah. But um, once you go from two dimension to three dimension, is it obvious that this is still better than, than PCA? <coughs> it's obvious to me. I'd be amazed if you got those two pictures in 2D and then in 3D PCA was as good as this. Um, but. Yes. So that, that, that radial effect might just be the number of words. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think it is. Okay. Yeah. OK, now I didn't tell you how we modeled um, a bag of words using a Boltzmann machine. And it turns out that a little bit of care has to go into it. And in particular, when we did that work, we didn't use the last trick. And the last trick helps a lot. Um, so we could do it better now, I think. 
So we start off with this binary bolts machine where you're seeing the input variables as these binary variables. And now we're going to replace each binary variable by a 2,000-way alternative. A binary variable is a two-way alternative. There's an easy generalization to a 2,000-way discrete alternative. So the idea is we're going to build ourselves a Boltzmann machine that for each, word, for each instance of a word in the document has one input unit. So if it's a 100-word document, there's going to be 100 input units. And each of these units is going to be a 2,000-way softmax, 2,000-way discrete variable. So we use 2,000-way variables. And in the data, you know, one of those is going to be on for each of these input variables. Then each hidden unit, because it's a bag of words, it doesn't care about the order, a hidden unit is going to have the same weights to all of the different input units. You can probably already see we can do the computation faster than the architecture I'm describing. Um, we're going to use as many of these visible units as there are non-stop words in the document. And so for each document, we'll get a different size network. So it's not really a Boltzmann machine. It's a family of Boltzmann machines. For a big document, you have a bigger Boltzmann machine. But they all have tied weights. Okay? So for the number of hidden units is always going to be the same. And for each hidden unit, it's got its weights to the visible units. As I have more visible units, you just keep reusing the same weights. So you're making a bigger Boltzmann machine, but no more parameters. And so you've got this family of different size machines. But there's one crucial thing you have to do to make this into a good density model, at least, which is a hidden unit is getting input from the visible units, which is fighting a bias. As you have more visible units, there's more input. And so you want more bias for it to fight. And so you have to scale the biases with the number of input units. Right, whatever, yes. Either way, but this is the way we currently think about it. And this makes a big difference. And now in the coming, uh, upcoming NIPs, we compare the density model you get for bags of words. This is work by Russell and Salakutinov and me. With things like latent Dirichlet allocation. And this gives a much better density model for bags of words. So you hold out some documents and you ask, you know. So here's just a picture of the model. You decide how many hidden units you're going to use. Um, we're going to use thousands, but. Uh, and then for this hidden unit, it'll have some weighted connections to this softmax and the same weighted connections to this softmax and the same to that softmax. And then this hidden unit will have different weighted connections than those, but the same to every softmax. Okay. I labored that a bit. And so we're going to start off by using an architecture like this where we go down to 10 Gaussian units here, 10 real-valued units. So we've done latent semantic analysis. I hope I'm using the terms right. Um, with a 10-component vector. And now we're going to try and do document retrieval with that. And we're going to compare with document retrieval using the vectors that you get with latent semantic analysis. So if we extract 10 numbers and retrieve documents on using 10 numbers, we do better than latent semantic analysis retrieving 50 numbers, and much better than latent semantic analysis re retrieving 10 numbers. In other words, each of our numbers is worth five times as much. And the amount of work you have to do is just linear in the number of numbers, um, if you're just doing a dumb linear search through the things you want to retrieve from. So it's a big win to have a lot more information in here. So one of these numbers is worth five of their numbers. So people doing this LSA will sometimes tell you LSA is optimal. And what they mean is it's optimal within the space of linear methods. Okay? Linear methods are completely hopeless, but within that space, it's optimal. I should say LSA was a really groundbreaking invention when it was done in the 90s. We couldn't do these more complicated things then. And it really amazed people how much information you could get just from statistics. People were surprised that it would work. But now we can do much better with nonlinear methods. So what would be the mean of this accuracy? Ah, this is saying, as a function of how many you retrieve, what fraction of them are in the same class as the retrieved document? We don't have a good way of saying, was this a relevant one? But if we use a bad way, but it's the same for all methods, that's the best we can do. And our bad way is to say, is it in the same class? So you put in a document that was an accounts and earnings, um, and you try and retrieve. 
You get the 10D code for this document. You compare with all the other 10D codes. You see which fits best. Is the one that fits best about accounts and earnings? Well, 43% of the time it is. Well, that's precision, huh? So this was kind of so not yes. recall. Yes. And this is sort of recall here. We didn't label the axes with the normal terminology because this was early in our career as um, information retrieval people, and we were still learning about it. Question. To get those pin numbers for the autoencoder, you need the weights. Yes. So that's a bunch more numbers. If you look at all the parameters that are involved in the encoding in both cases, how does that total number of parameters compare? We have more. Um, not, yeah, I need to think about this. Um, if you're doing PCA from 2000 down to 10, you've got 20,000 numbers, right? Here, we've got a million numbers right there. In other words, this is only going to work on big document sets. It won't work on small document sets. We need to be able to estimate a million numbers here. What's small is the code that you use at runtime. OK, so the point is, at runtime, when you're actually doing the retrieval, it's linear in the length of the code if you do it in a dumb way of just matching codes. So you want a short code. But in order to find the values of the code, don't you need the actual weights? Oh, if you're asking about the storage in the machine, it needs these weights sort of once for all documents. It doesn't need these weights per document. Also, if you've got a big database, what you do is overnight you sort of run this and you store these 10 numbers with each document. So at retrieval time, you hope you don't have to run that at all. That, that would be analogous to the LSA where you've got the basis vectors and you have to store those once for each document. I mean, once, period, for all documents. Right, yes. These are like the basis vectors. Right. But the speed at retrieval time is going to depend on how many numbers you have here. OK. So what we're going to do now is. Is it really a question of speed, or is it choosing the right bottleneck so that things get separated enough? I mean, is it, in other words, what's the? Oh, the motor, it, it, it's the case with all these methods mm -hmm. that if I use more units here, I'll do better, okay. um, up to quite a big number. It's not that we have to go down to a small number to do well at all. If I make 100 here, I'll do much better. Okay. So it really is a computational efficiency. It's the efficiency at, at retrieval time. That's what Ultimately, at retrieval time, you don't necessarily scan, right? You use some sort of a KD tree or other or quantization. Absolutely. And Absolutely. So this really isn't of much interest yet, because you're going to use much faster techniques than serial matching. Okay. Um, so that's what the next point is going to address. It's just to compare with LSA and show we get more information per component of the code than LSA does. So now what we're going to do is we're going to have, instead of making these linear units, we'll make them binary units when we do the, first, when we do the learning. So we learn this module, we learn this module, we learn this module with binary units, we learn this module, we learn this, we unroll it all, and then we start doing backpropagation. And here, as we're doing the backpropagation, we inject noise. And the point of that is to force these guys to be either very firmly on or very firmly off. That's the only way they can resist this noise. If they're in their middle range, then the noise, which has quite a big standard deviation, will just swamp them, and they won't be able to transmit any useful information. And the way we add the noise is for each training case, we make up a noise vector ahead of time. But there's so many training cases, it can't learn all that information. There's um, of the order of a million training cases. So now we've got what I call deterministic noise. For any one case, it's always the same noise. So we can use methods like conjugate gradient for doing the backpropagation. Um, if you don't want to use conjugate gradient, then you can make this be true random noise. But you train this thing up, and what you discover is you first train it without noise, and then you add the noise. When you add the noise here, these become far more binary. So they started off being learned as binary units. Then when you use backprop, they're logistic units with continuous values, and you force those values to the extremes. So that now when you threshold these, um, 
you don't threshold at 0.5, you threshold a bit lower than that. But when you threshold them, you can still reconstruct quite well from the thresholded values. So now what we've done is we've converted a bag of words into a binary vector. Now we can do what we call semantic hashing. So here's a document. You compute its binary vector, and you go into a memory space, and that binary vector is viewed as an address in that memory space. And because of the way these binary vectors were computed, it's not like a normal hash function. A normal hash function, you try and sort of spread things out randomly over the memory, just so you get things sort of evenly populating the memory. Here what we're doing is, because of the way the learning's done, we expect that documents with similar words in will be near one another in this space. And it may not seem like a 30-dimensional space is very high-dimensional, but there's a lot of space in 30 dimensions. Um, so I have an analogy for supermarket search here. If I go into a supermarket and I want to find things that are like a can of sardines, what I do is I go to the teller and say, where do you keep the sardines? And then I go to where the sardines are kept, and I just look around. And there's the tuna and the pilchards and the... Now, unfortunately, the anchovies are way over here with the pizza toppings. Um, but that's because supermarkets are just really 2D things. I mean, they're this two-dimensional strip in 3D, and you can't have um, everything that you'd like near each other. But in a 30-dimensional supermarket, life would be wonderful. You could have the, the organic things here and the cheap things there. And you could have the slightly beyond their date and very cheap here and the healthy ones here. And you have the kosher ones there and the unkosher ones there. And in 30 dimensions, you could, you know, arrange it all very nicely so similar things were near one another in all these different dimensions of similarity. So the idea is maybe with 30 dimensions, we can organize documents so that similar ones really are near one another. And if this autoencoder will do that for us, then we have a very fast way of finding similar documents. You just go to the address of the document, documents similar to a query document. You go there, and you just look around. And so you enumerate the local neighborhood in terms of the hamming distance from where you are. And so you might think you would form a list, but actually, in a sense, you already have a list. You have this address, and as you flip bits in that address, you get the addresses of the next things. So why actually form a list? You've got your list. You've got uh, an address, and you've got a way of getting to the next guy. So that's a list. And so in a sense, this memory space, if I have a billion addresses here, I really have a billion things, each of which is a list a billion long, all in the same memory space. So it's sort of instant retrieval of a shortlist. Now, that shortlist may not be very good because you're only using 30 bits. So our proposal is use those 30 bits, and then once you've got a shortlist of, say, 10,000 or something, you can do a serial search using a longer bit code. You could use, say, 256 bits, which is still much better than using... LSA or something, and 256 bits are very easy to store. You just have to store four words with each document. Are you going to say something about what you lose by going to bits as opposed to real valued numbers? Because you could do the same trick, but just you know, have real values. Along. We have done some comparisons on that, and I can say one comparison. One of our bits is worth um, slightly more than one of the LSA real numbers. So if you look at compare with LSA, um, our, what, one bit for one of these deep bits is worth about the same as one of their real numbers, but is much cheaper to store and match. So, roughly speaking, that's a comparison. So, here's another view of semantic hashing. Um, all fast methods of retrieving things involve intersecting lists. This is sort of roughly. Okay. Many fast methods of retrieving things involve intersecting lists, all the ones I know about. And what we're doing here is we're intersecting lists. Because when you extract one of the bits of the code, that's a list of half the things in the space. Okay, it's all the documents that have that bit of their address turned on. So you can see it as a list of half the space. And the next bit in your code is another list, orthogonal list, of another set of half the space. And now you want to intersect those 30 lists. Well, that's what a memory fetch does. So we're saying a memory fetch really is a list intersection if you can map your lists onto these bits in the address. And so that's what we're doing. We're just using machine learning to turn the information retrieval problem into the kind of list intersection that all computers like to do, namely a memory fetch. Okay. 
So the question is, how good is it? We've only implemented it with 20-bit codes, and that's quite a lot different from 30-bit codes. Um, and this is on that same document set I showed you before of a million documents, so 20-bit codes is about right. Uh, I'm not going to talk about what you do if you get collisions, two documents at the same address. If you're not a computer scientist, you don't sort of think about that. And if you are a computer scientist, you know what to do about it anyway. So, um, What we do is we take that short list, and you can now feed the short list to TFIDF, which is a sort of slow but gold standard method, fairly gold standard method. Um, and you can compare with other methods. Um, so the semantic hashing is the fastest method we know. I can't see how you can get a faster method of getting a short list. Um, and if you feed the outputs of that short list to P TFIDF, then what you get is performance that's actually slightly better than TFIDF alone. If you do TFIDF on everything, which you can do relatively efficiently using um, inverse indices and things, um, it's better if you just do it on a short list. And that means that some of the things that TFIDF would have said are good our shortlist says are bad, they're not in our shortlist, and they shouldn't be there, because we're doing better by filtering with this. OK. Now, all of that was for document retrieval. That's all published stuff. Um, and it's not so interesting for document retrieval, because there's other good ways of doing it. But for image retrieval, I think it's more interesting. Just, just on the speed issue, right? You're comparing when you compare it to LSH. You're saying the speed of computing the 20 bits is faster? No. What I'm saying is, um, I'm really thinking of it like this, that you can have these 20 bits stored with each document, and then it's just a memory lookup. Okay. And LSH has bigger codes than that. You can't do it by just a memory lookup, as far as I know. OK. okay. So for image retrieval, until fairly recently, it was either done with things like color histograms or done more effectively, I think, using the captions. Um, but obviously, you like to do it by recognizing what's in the image. Um, and you'd like to do object recognition and recognize what's in the image and do it like that. Because the point is, a pixel isn't like a word in a document. A pixel doesn't tell you much about what's there, whereas a word tells you a lot about the document. The things that are like words in a document are objects in the image. But recognizing those is kind of tough. So. Maybe we can do something else. Maybe we can extract things that aren't as good as objects, but nevertheless contain quite a lot of content about what's in the image in a short binary code. And then we can use these ideas about short binary codes either for quick serial matches or for semant semantic hashing. So we propose to use a two-stage method where you use a short binary code, um, a very short one, to get a short list. And then for that short list, you use a longer binary code. Now, there's no point in doing that unless your longer binary code is going to be work reasonably well. So all we've done so far is checked this longer binary code to see that it works reasonably well for image retrieval. And those are the results I'm going to be showing you. Um, that's just four words of memory for each image. And you can match quite fast. And the question is, how good are these codes? What do you get when you try matching with these 256 bits? Now. We thought about this a few years ago when we were doing document retrieval. And then Yair Weiss and Antonia Toralba and Rob Fergus came along and figured out a different method of getting binary codes, um, which was published in NIPS, which is much faster than our machine learning method. And they claimed that it worked better. And it's simple and it has no free parameters. Um, when they claimed that it worked better, what happened was they didn't know how to train restricted Boltzmann machines on real value data. And so on real value pixels. And so they gave up on using the pixels and they used gist features as the input to the system. So they took the image and they took it down to 384 numbers before trying to compress it to this binary code. And it turns out that's much too much compression much too soon. If you train on the raw pixels and you do it properly, it's actually completely reversed. Their method is basically hopeless, and our method is much, much better. They're friends of mine. So Alex Krzyzewski, a long-suffering graduate student of mine, um, spent a long time trying to figure out how to train these autoencoders properly with Gaussian visible units. 
This morning I talked about something better than that, where you model covariance. But for this work, we're just using the ordinary Gaussian units, that is linear units, which assume have an independent Gaussian containment on each unit. Um, to do the training, you need a very small learning rate. You mustn't add noise when you make the reconstructions, and you need a cluster machine or a GPU board. And you need to use a lot of units in the early layers because you're going from real-valued things to binary things. And so he goes to a big set of binary things. And then we're going to compare with the spectral hashing method that got published in NIPS and the Euclidean matching, which is going to be very expensive, um, but will at least show us what are literally very similar images. I don't know if you can see this. I first want to show you the kind of filters you get if you apply this Gaussian RBM to these small color images. We're going to do it on 32 by 32 color images. And they're very different from the means that I showed you this morning. They're much more like the variances. Um, and that's if you just learn these by themselves. If you learn the covariances, these become completely different. Again, they have the flavor that most of them are pure black and white. And this is now on 32 by 32. So they're highly localized in space. They're high frequency, and they're pure, pure black and white. And a few of them don't care at all about intensity. They're completely insensitive to intensity, and they're color contrasts. This isn't a topographic map. This is just a random subset. In this case, you learn 10,000 of them. So at least it shows you it's learning something that's generally regarded to be a sensible way to start processing an image. So the architecture actually used for the autoencoder was the three color channels, not pre-processed at all. Um, he used 8,000 units here, then 4,000, then 2,000, then 1,000, then 500, then 256. And there's absolutely no theoretical justification for this. Um, there's a justification for using powers of two because he's using a GPU board, um, but that's about it. But what we do know is if you use a small layer there, it doesn't work nearly as well. And using lots of layers seems to work better. And also, it's very robust. If you went from 2048 to 700 here to 256, it would probably work about the same, maybe slightly worse. So although this is arbitrary, it's not arbitrary stuff that's sensitive. That's the good news. Um, and it takes a few days on a GPU to train this whole thing. This thing has, well, 4 times 8, 32 million weights there. Overall, it's got about 67 million parameters. Um, it's trained on color images, but he has 80 million of those. And he actually only bothers to train on 2 million. That's plenty. Well, I should say, in this work, he's training on 2 million. And he's doing retrieval on another 2 million that it wasn't trained on. Um, he could do better, probably, by training on 80 million, but it would take longer. So what we have here is this is a query image, distance 0. These are the 15 best retrieved images in this order, and it's showing you the distance. And this is a distance in Hamming space for the 256-bit codes. So you have to go quite a way until you get to another one. But if you look at the top row, it's all men with shirts and ties, which seems nice. Um, this is spectral hashing, which doesn't have any men with shirts and ties, um, and has some things that you wouldn't have thought of as particularly similar to that. We couldn't believe these results, and so I kept talking to Yae and saying, spectral hashing isn't working. And he said, yeah, I know. <laughs> Um, so we think we haven't got a bug. Our code, we've run this code on things that they've run their code on and it gives the same results. So we're fairly sure this is the results, even though they look terrible. Um, this is Euclidean distance, which is obviously slow. And you'll notice Euclidean distance is much more similar to us. But we seem to be doing something better than Euclidean distance. I would argue that these are more like that. Notice that the fine details, look at this guy's face. He doesn't have a face. Um, but he does have a shirt and tie. OK, so the order is we're the best. This is the second best, and spectral hashing is the worst for that one. Here's Michael Jackson. Um, this is Euclidean distance match to Michael Jackson. We at least get people nearly all the time. Um, spectral hashing, well, there's something else that's very strange, too. I, I accuse Alex of making a mistake in using um, 
64-dimensional spectral hashing. And the reason was, look at these distances. It's got something at a distance of 23 from this thing. And our nearest thing is a distance of 61 and is much more similar. Now, how could that be? How could it have something that's really close and very dissimilar? Well, because their bits are no good. Their bits are very far from orthogonal to each other. And it can have something that has many bits the same and just isn't at all similar. So its furthest thing is only 26 bits away. It's just not laying the things out. It's not using the space uniformly like information theory says you should. Um, OK, so here again, I would argue we do a better than Euclidean distance and much better than spectral hashing. Why would you expect, why would you expect low distance in your hashing to be sensible? Why, why, why do you, it, it seems like it's, it seems like you didn't train for it, and you didn't, this seems like a happy accident, I mean, right? Because you know, because we know from the autoencoder that similar things will get similar codes. Why? Just because of the way it's trained. Well, I also have evidence, right? right but, but there's nothing semantic about the algorithm, right? It's not like you're asking that nearby things Ah, uh, but you're asking it to find a few features that describe an image such that from those few features I can reconstruct the image. So think about it for documents going down to two features. And suppose you had sports documents and politics documents. You'd really like one of those features to be sports versus politics. Because if it's sports, you can raise the probability of all the sports words and lower the probability of all the document words and vice versa. So you'd really like to go for that abstract feature of sports versus politics. But, but maybe, uh, maybe there's something odd, like this pixel is black and that one's purple. That also distinguishes and makes it very, very But that won't, that won't help you predict other pixels as well. well. So, for example, take here's a well known semantic feature that you can actually extract from an image quite easily indoor versus outdoor. It's quite easy to do that. And the point about indoor is you expect to see sort of straight edges and particular kinds of illumination. And outdoor, you expect to see far more rough things. So, that one feature will tell you a lot about what, how to reconstruct the image. And what we're hoping is we're, if you could get 30 features, all of the same quality of indoor versus outdoor, but all orthogonal to that, you'd really be in business for image retrieval. And we're trying to move in that direction. Let me carry on. So here's a flower, a dandelion, I think. Um, we get about half the other things we get are dandelions. And in this case, about half with other things we get are also in the 15 closest in Euclidean distance. So this is some evidence we haven't moved very far away from the sort of raw input metric. So that's bad news for the abstract idea. But what's bad news for that idea is good news for the following idea. Wouldn't it be nice if you could do Euclidean matches just by using 256 bits instead of using about 3,000 real numbers? And apparently we can. I mean, we can get half the things that come out close in Euclidean distance we can get by matching these 256-bit things and looking at Hamming distance. Um, so it's good in one way and bad in another way. Spectral hashing, as usual, it got one dandelion, um, but hmm. So have you compared with this shock code with like a SIF feature or something? No, not yet. So here's an outdoor scene. Um, and here's what we retrieve. This actually is visually very similar, but you can see it's not actually an outdoor. It's a sort of drum and, or a swimming pool or something. Um, but notice the Euclidean distance also retrieves. Does Euclidean distance get that thing? Yeah, there it is. That's the same thing retrieved by Euclidean distance. So again, about half of these with Euclidean distance are the same as the things we retrieve. But we're much better than spectral hashing. I mean, I don't think that's particularly like that. But in some ways, it's not unexpected because if the autoencoder is trying to really reproduce the image, it'll, you know, the definition of reproduction is Euclidean distance, right? Right. But um, we know that it generalizes to some extent. So if you train a deep autoencoder like this and you then generate from it, you can generate things shifted slightly and so on. A little. A little. It'll do small shifts and things. But has anyone considered training the autoencoder where rather than giving the image itself as the thing to match, you give another member of the class, you know, if you had labeled. We've thought about things like that and people have done things like that, but I'm not going to talk about that, but that's sort of work in progress, yes. 
so here's what I think is the best example. Um, so that's a group of people. That's the sort of high-level description. And the low-level description is there's a white blob. So if you look at things like this, it really matched on the white blob. But if you look at these retrievals, um, about half of them are groups of people. If you look at Euclidean distance, it's not doing nearly as well on groups of people here. There's a lot of um, fairly high-frequency variation in this image, right? And that high-frequency variation, I think there's underlying features that are saying high-frequency variation. And therefore, other images with similar high-frequency variation around about there are being matched. Whereas if you do Euclidean distance and you want to match high-frequency variation, the best you can do is find something that's very uniform that's the average. If you start introducing any variation into this thing, it'll probably disagree and you'll get extra variance. So unless you can have perfectly correlated variation, you're better with no variation at all. And you see Euclidean distance likes things like this. That's its second best match, which is the sort of average of all this image everywhere. But we're definitely doing much better at getting groups of people. And spectral hashing isn't. It gets some. Euclidean is pixel by pixel. Euclidean. Pixel by pixel, yeah. Oh, so anything that's not normalized is screw up everything. Yep. Now, we should also try cosine of the angle just to normalize for intensity. Right. But remember, remember, it's, there's two million images being used here. So. But using the color histogram probably would be better than Well, we should also try that. Like, it, this was only done a couple of weeks ago. And I, as you know, I wasn't planning to talk about this, but you wanted me to, so I did. <laughs> there's um, a couple of obvious things we still have to do, which is implement the semantic hashing stage and show that using that as a front end for this slightly longer stage doesn't mess it up. We know that it doesn't with documents, but we don't know that it doesn't with images. Um, if you lose some recall on images, it may not matter so much since people don't worry about what they don't see. Um, so you can get away with bad recall. It's precision you can't get away with being bad. There's an obvious extension to this, which is the first half of the talk showed you how to get short codes for documents. And the second half shows you how to get short codes for images. So why not use the same short code? Now, that's, you get three wins from that. Um, you might expect that if you use the words as well, it'll help you get more abstract features, because the link to the words goes via more abstract things that you're more interested in. So it'll pull you in that direction. Um, we know that compared with um, LDA models, for example, latent late Dirichlet allocation models, we have a better model of the densities of bags of words. So we think these codes got by RBMs, even in one layer, is a better way of modeling um, bags of words. So we're going to get a win there. And the multi-layer is a much better way of modeling bags of words. Um, we do well on images. And the interaction should help us a lot. So that's, an, very, that's a very obvious big win. Um, and would go some way to answering John's objections, because you show that from the image, you can actually start producing words that show you understand some semantics. You know, people, it should say. There's a less obvious win. Um, semantic hashing is incredibly fast um, if you've already got the codes for all the documents and you're just looking up what ones are similar to this one. Um, but you can't really go far beyond 32 bits. Maybe you could go to 36 bits or something, but you can't go to like 100 bits. Um, but it's so fast that you could do it several times. And if you go to a memory address, you have this sort of Hamming ball. It's easy to enumerate the Hamming ball in ascending address order. So you can enumerate it ordered in the address space. So now if I take another query and get its Hamming ball, I can intersect those two Hamming balls efficiently because they're ordered lists. And it's so fast, so why don't I now say, OK, I'm going to get myself 20 lists like this and intersect them. And it's going to be serial intersection of these lists now, but it's linear in the list length. So if I take a Hamming ball that contains 10,000 things, it's sort of 20 times 10,000 operations to intersect these lists. And so I can afford to access with several queries. So I can apply a transformation to the query image. I can, for example, do a small translation. Well, a small translation, you don't have to do. It's already a, it can already cope with a very small translation. But what about a somewhat bigger translation? So you'd have to worry about edge effects and things. Um, and so 
to get rid of those, we're using 28 by 28 images so we can translate a few pixels and still be inside the image. Um, and that's work in progress to see if you can use the speed of semantic hashing to allow you to match transform things by simply trying a number of transformations because you can afford to do that. So the summary of what I've said is that we have this learning algorithm that can learn layers of features efficiently. We can use it to learn big representations for doing object recognition, or we can learn it to use small representations for doing retrieval. And in particular, we can learn binary representations, which are very cheap to store. Um, and we can use this semantic hashing, which amounts to using the speed of hash coding to do approximate matching. And then, if this works nicely with images, we can start trying to deal with obvious transformations by taking the query and transforming it and doing multiple matches and then intersecting them. So we have a way of converting the speed of semantic hashing into better quality of retrieval. OK, that's it. Samples, you show that the features are either text or pixels. Right. Have you thought of features that are combination? For example, like when you do a search on the web, you type some text and you find text in the web page where the image is, and maybe that can help you learn more. Because there's, I mean, sort of one reason I'm talking about this here is there's a huge number of directions to go in from here, right? Once you've got a way of getting codes, there's all sorts of questions about what you apply it to. And we've just done some of the most obvious things. Mainly, I was concerned to compare it with spectral hashing, because that was so depressing that that dumb technique worked better than our technique. And I want to show it really didn't. So the main point was to actually compare with spectral hashing. Um, but there's all sorts of things you can do. And this morning, people raised the idea of, well, you know, if you're dealing with images, you really don't want to start with pixels, because image processing people know what to do with pixels. You want to start with something higher up. Um, and I sort of agree with that. It was just to compare with spectral hashing and also to sort of know that we can do the whole thing with this technique. We start with pixels. But I agree, we ought, there's all sorts of other inputs you can use. Question. So the, one of the messages here, the main message to me, is um, if you use compression, compression will force you to find relevant features that you can use to do things. Uh, if you've got a good way of finding features, yes. And the, and the RVM uh, is a compression mechanism that, that seems to find some good features. Yes. If you view it as a compression mechanism, have you compared it purely as a compression mechanism with other things, you know, like GZIP or other compression techniques? We haven't, no. I, don't, I wouldn't expect it to be really good as a compression mechanism. I wouldn't want to... Um, compression per se, there's something special then. There's something special which is it's taking similar things to similar codes. That's very important. And compression doesn't necessarily do that. So I think the fact that it's a sort of smooth function, because the weights don't get that big, so it's a fairly smooth function from inputs to codes, I think that's what's important. And that helps to answer John's question too. Why do you expect similar things to have similar codes? two things going on simultaneously here, right? If you just say, get me similar, right? And if you gave the, the metric, let's say, including distance metric, right? Then, well, in some sense, you're, you're stuck because if there's no skew, if the distribution is uniform, you can't do it, right? You're right. just going to pick 30 values at random and, and sort of encode those. But it's the fact that the data is, you know, lives on a manifold and it exactly. has very different density and so on. So the thing is encoding, trying to minimize the difference of reconstruction given the prior distribution, the implicit prior distribution that arises when you give it a certain set of learning examples. Right? Exactly. This will only work for data that lies on a low dimensional manifold in a high dimensional space. And what's more, where there's obvious correlations in the raw data that you can pick up on that really are relevant to that manifold. I could put in some obvious correlations in the data um, that were nothing to do with the manifold by sort of watermarking or something. Um, and this maybe would pick up on those, um, and there wouldn't be any use at all. But real vision isn't like that. In real vision, it's screaming out at you. 
that there's these correlations and they're caused by what's really causing the image. And if you're only sensitive to them, you'll be able to find out what caused the image. And that's the kind of domain in which it works. And that might be, when you're doing compression, ultimately your goal is to introduce the least visual distortion, right? And here, that's not obvious that that's what the autoencoder is doing. It's, it's being asked to minimize the Euclidean difference, but it's also being asked to do it at a frequency that is whatever it's in your training set, right? You only have, what is it, 10,000 or, or some number of images out of this. this right, but as you go up through these layers of features, if, for example, you take an image and you go up and you come back down again, it can sort of shift it a bit and things like that. And so I should show some examples of that. Um, but it's not, it's not sort of determined to keep the pixels in the same place. It has a little bit of translational right, it's flexibility. It's not and shifted. It just so happens that the distribution of the data space means that small shifts don't kill you in terms of your clicking exactly. distance. Right? Exactly, because locally, if you take a patch of image and you shift it slightly, there's probably other things in your database that are very like that shifted patch of image. Exactly, yeah. yeah so this desirable property of sort of similarity, mapping similar kind of uh, images into similar neighbors, is it reflected in the energy function definition in the Boltzmann machine? Or, or, or what, no. What you know, learning that, incorporate that property? It basically comes out of the weights not being that big, so you get a smooth function. I mean, that's one important thing. By using very big weights, you can get a very non-smooth function. So very similar things can go to very different places. Um, but it also, like Rick says, the data has to have a lot of structure. It has to lie in this low-dimensional manifold. And so this will find that manifold. And if the data isn't like that, this kind of method won't work. But almost all data is like that. Almost all highly structured data. Are you regularizing the weights? Um, we typically do regularize them a little bit, but it's not really that important. Because if, if you're regularizing it, then you know, your, the objective function is encoding that similar image should go to exactly. similar codes. But typically, with a lot of data, you don't need to regularize them. They just stay small anyway. Yes, so one reason we're trying in doing this image retrieval is to create a visual world. In a sense, our bits are like those words. Like our individual bits are like those words. And then in semantic hashing, you think of if a bit is like a word, then the inverted index is just all the addresses that have that bit turned on. Okay. So in that case, I'm like, once you interpret the bit as kind of discrete word, then you can use the same but you don't need to. If you've got it in 30 bits, you can use something much better because you can intersect all those lists in one machine instruction. And I bet they can't, even John Platt can't intersect all those lists in one machine instruction. <laughs> but Intel can. <laughs> but they have to build a big machine. <laughs>